I would like to welcome you to the Daria Connectivity Roundtable today. Um, we are celebrating and discussing six decades of digital arts and museums and talking about a new infrastructure that might be possible. Um, what I'm going to do, this is a little bit different than some of the other sessions. I'm going to, uh, we'll introduce the topic and the main question of the session today. We'll introduce the uh, panel of discussants that we have. Then each discussant is going to give a short statement in answer to the main question. And then afterwards, we'll have about 20 minutes for discussion among the panelists. And then we'll open it up to in the last 20 minutes for discussions in a Q&A style from the audience as well. The worldwide museum community is more than 55,000 institutions strong. The US has a, uh, more than 17,000 alone, Japan 5,700, Germany 6,300 and so forth. It may seem that this infrastructure in all its diversity and history is such a mighty monolith that, that drastic change would be difficult to imagine. But the digital age enters with force and alters that status quo. It comes with new tools to present, collect, access cultural art artifacts, connect, explore, research, manage, and visualize data. It comes with its own digital-born art and cultures, as we all know, which have their own history of more than five decades now. Digital arts and cultures play a role in 200 biennials around the world and in more than 100 specialized festivals but do not significantly enter the walls of the museum world so far. The museum setting in our contemporary world has diversified not only due to the digital revolution that has come to permeate global culture and interaction, but also due to many other non-digital transitions that have come about alongside and due to the digital developments. Digital technology has in introduced new multifarious ways of in expression and also changed the nature of the way that objects are collected as well as changing the expressive methods available for displaying and archiving collections. These new objects and techniques used to preserve and interpret them embrace interactivity, make use of linear and as well as non-linear structures equally and encourage new methods of ever deepening degrees of participation. The massive developments in digital born media art and popular culture have been growing exponentially for decades now. Consequently, this requires that among the thousands of existing museums for traditional art media, a significant percentage of new museums and archives dealing with the art and cultures of our time must be dedicated to fulfill their fundamental functions to collect, preserve, explore, mediate, and taxonomize digital culture. But how could that be done? Historically, Wunderkammer und Studielo were places of play, the practice of, where the practice of Ars Combinatoria created something new that each viewing was by through recombination chance or instant linkage and inspiration. Creative process and knowledge production essentially were driven by comparison and interactive combination. Today, the active component, which is later restricted by the object-oriented museum, is re-entering the digital museum and archive. In the current setting of digital media and the enveloping windowless dark space, which functions again now as a precondition and enforcement for a digital ars combinatoria, digital artworks, object representations, and clusters of image worlds can now be partly experienced interactively as well as influenced by the audience and recombined. Digitization also offers new possibilities for the study of cultural heritage with computational big data methods. Today, as over two billion people create glo global digital culture by sharing their photos, video links, writing posts, comments, ratings, etc., it is possible to use the same technology to study this universe of contemporary digital culture. Also, the future archive will connect the object or document with other archives, artifacts, information, people, and events. Perhaps the archive will progressively absorb duties and, feature, and, and features from other institutions and cultural entities such as databases, installations, games, networks, knowledge tools, etc. On the other hand, many new instruments such as gaming systems or cell phones 
already come with their own archival functions and amalgamate seamlessly with other archives. These technologies can be used by museums and archives as interfaces for engagement and empowerment. Ironically, the most extensive archive is run by the United States National Security Agency, NSA, collecting all personal data, as we know, phone calls, Skype conversations, email, shopping, lists of all citizens and basically all countries, in basically all countries of the world. Except the five I countries, information that became known in 2000, 13, when Edward Snowden leaked that structure to the world. So the question is, and the question that the discussants are going to be addressing in their statements is, how do museums and archives need to evolve in order to collect, preserve, and also show the digital art of our time? What kinds of strategies or concerted collections and preservation tools might be necessary to move forward? So now I'm going to, we're going to do quick bi uh, biographical information on each and then we're going to go to statements from each one of them. Giselle Bügelmann is an artist, researcher, curator and professor. Her work includes interventions in public spaces, network projects and mobile apps. Her artistic and in investigative practice is based on a critical approach towards digital media and the information systems. Bügelmann is an associated professor at the School of Architecture and Urban Planning of the University of Sao Paulo, where she specializes in digital art conservation, intangible heritage, and interface design. Author of many books and articles about digital culture, she's an, the editor of Possible uh, Futures, which you can see also outside, Art Museums and Digital Archives. Sarah Kinderdine researches at the forefront of the interactive and immersive experiences for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. She was also the keynote speaker this morning. She was introduced uh, uh, this morning in 2017. She was appointed professor in digital museology at EPFL, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it correctly, thank you very much. Um, and she's building a new lab to explore the convergence of aesthetic practice, visual analytics, and cultural data. Marianne Ping Wang, Denmark, Associate Professor for, uh, at uh, School of Communication and Culture at Aarhus University. She is currently collaborating with European Capital of Culture, Aarhus 2017. Um, and she serves in Daria European Union as co-head for Daria Research and Education and organized Daria Innovation Forum 2017. Um, so Daria Humanities at Scale and Horizon 2020. From, uh, since 2015, she's a member of, I think she, you're still a member, right? Of uh, Europeana Research Advisory Board. Recent publication, Archival Biases and Cross-Archival Sharing. Christoph Thun Hohenstein, um, coming from here in Austria, assumed the direction of the MAC, which is the Museum of Angewandte Kunst, the Museum of Applied, Applied Arts, in 2011. He was the director of the Austrian Cultural Forum of New York from 1999 to 2007. He's also, furthermore, head of the Vienna Biennale, which was founded in 2015 and has published on topics dealing with all European integration and contemporary culture and art. He's held numerous lectures on these topics. Howard Besser is a scholar of uh, digital preservation, digital libraries, and preservation of film and video. He's a professor of cinema studies and the founding director of the NYU Moving Image Archiving and Preservation Program a graduate program in the Tisch School. Besser is a prolific writer and speaker and has consulted with many governments, educational institutions, and arts agencies on digital preservation matters. He was closely involved in the development of the Dublin Core and metadata encoding, encoding and transmission standard, international standards within librarianship. Patricia Falcao is a time-based media conservator at the Tate in London, and for the, for the uh, previous eight years, she's been doing intensive research on the preservation of software-based artwork. Uh, we also are very happy to have her on the faculty for the Media Arts Histories Program and Media Arts Cultures Program, teaching conservation to the students at the Danube University. And last but not least, Win Wendy Coons. 
uh, directs the Exhibition Strategies Division at the Department for Image Science on the academic staff since 2005. She's responsible for curricular development, teaching, working professionals in support of research initiatives. She's responsible for a Master of Arts programs related to digital cultural life, its histories and, fe and futures, and is primarily coordinating staff for the low residency program Media Art Histories and the EU-funded Erasmus Mundus European Master of Excellence program in Media Art Cultures. She's a founder of the Media Art Histories Archive following the Refresh Conference in 2005. So now I'm going to remind the speakers of the question, and we're going to have their have their statements. Um, they're set up in a in a fantastic uh, panel here, and we're going to first hear from Patricia Falcao, and I'm going to read the question again. What we would like for her statement to address about how museums and archives may evolve in order to collect, preserve, and show the digital art of our time. And thank you, Patricia. Let's. Yes, you have a microphone. Fantastic. Is this on? No. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> oh now, now there's a light. OK. Uh, OK, I, I'm going to ad lib a little bit, so I don't think I'll need this five minutes. Uh, I think one key aspect, uh, it, from my view, the issue. Sorry? Oh, so it's still not working actually. Do you have a. Okay. Is this better? Oh, okay. Um, I'm, ju I'm just thinking back at the, the diagram I've just showed before with the percentage of time based media in the, the collection. And I think that's where the problem starts because, well, sorry, I, I'm. I'm Thinking from within the museum, which is a very narrow number of institutions that actually have any sort of responsibility for these types of works. And actually one of the key problems there is that I, at least in my experience, there's a lot less overlap between different areas yes. that are interested in collecting the, the digital based arts than one would hope for, you know, between media arts festivals, um. art not me, uh, between media arts festivals and uh, contemporary art museums, archives. I think with digital, the problems will end up being very similar to everybody. And I mean, it's, it's really, my feeling is always that it's separate worlds. And I know there are quite a few very good people that overlap that, but I don't think that's the general, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, in, in more practical terms, I think, People need, in the institutions need to be confident they can deal with these issues. And it's made a huge difference to, for me to go to a curator and say, no, that's fine, we can do that. You know, as, as a conservator or as a registrar and say, no, that's okay, it might take us a little bit longer, but we can do that. And for that, you need to have time to learn and you have to have a staff that knows what they're doing and, or, well, that has a chance to learn what they need to do. And there's the need to develop that knowledge, which is sort of what's been going on in, the, in this very limited area in museums of contemporary art, but it's also going on in, in digital preservation, and I'm sure in the archives that are having to deal with these problems as well. So on how they <laughs> that's my, my other personality. <laughs> also, <laughs> what we create an application. I mean, like I said, the strategies will be very similar. So if you're thinking about software and emulation, there's no reason why there couldn't be a series of libraries um, of software that people could access or share or copy over and have many copies to keep things safe and so on, which and agree on tools that they need. So that there's no, I don't think there's a lack of solutions. There's just a lack of coordination on, um, bringing those together. Um, a video. And yeah, I think, I mean, that's, that's the key point. Sorry, it's very basic, but it's, um, that's probably what, what I have to say. Yeah, that's good. And we're going to build on as we go along. 
Okay. Giselle, um, how would you say that museums and archives need to be evolving to collect uh, and preserve digital art of our time? Uh, I don't know if I have much more to say, uh, more than I already presented in the morning, uh, but uh, I will focus more on online art than in digital art in general. So I will read a short statement because I think that I have the worst English here in our uh, so obsolescence, dysfunctional equipment and files not found, uh, I think that this seems the, to be the most perfect image uh, of uh, net culture and the paradigm of uh, online life. Uh, and I have been uh, repeating that perhaps this imminence uh, of disappearance uh, justifies the ap apocalyptic tone that is suggested by the most elementary comments of digital editing programs, which continually invite us to save files and not simply to store them. Uh, the incitation is somewhat justified, and that is why I revisit uh, here some considerations I have made in my essay at this book, uh, Possible Futures, that uh, my answer is that I think that reinventing memory is necessary now. Also one of the adages of contemporaneity is the internet does not forget. The truth is that social networks do not let us remember. The information architecture of these flowing data spaces does not favor retrospective queries. And this not mean that the data is not there. On the contrary, it is. It is simply not accessible by search engines. If you go now to a website that it's the Internet Lives, Live web stats, we will see that in one second, uh, there were kind of 800 uh, pictures uploaded in one second to Instagram that it's more or less kind of 48,000 pictures in one day. Uh, and it's an amount of production of data every day. And all this data is part of our affective memory. And this memory, it's becoming something that you cannot retrieve anymore. And much, and uh, part of this memory is also part of uh, our, not just our affective memory, but it's part of our digital heritage and part of artworks. So from my point of view, our tools must be, we must learn how to negotiate in a moment where memory became also a corporate issue and everything can disappear in one second from one moment to the other. We just, we, we talked, talked about the GeoCities case and I, uh, I found myself thinking about, and if Facebook just decides that it will finish or Google stops today, what will happen to our memory that it's stored there and how many, uh, how, how many artworks deals with all those systems and apparatus. So there is a question that it's how those services track us, but also there is a very important issue to deal that our memory is also a corporate issue and this uh, deserves a kind of ethical code that in some ways our our archives must elaborate and answer in some ways. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Oliver, the museums and archives evolution to uh, include digital art of our time? Yes, as we know, uh, compared to traditional art forms um, like painting or sculpture, digital media art has a multifarious and a, and a fairly complex potential due to its ability to uh, use databases and three-dimensionality, three, three interactivity, and all these uh, complex image forms. Um, and, and, it's, and, and as we know, digital art uses those to uh, deal also with really complex 
topics of our time, so like, like climate change, to visualize um, uh, the civilians' uh, uh, problem, um, the media and image revolution, um, even the virtualization of finance markets, which is, uh, as, as we all know, such a powerful uh, development which all, all affects us. And, um, and so, and we can also show this uh, with our archive, but also with other archives uh, empirically, that digital art really does these clusters, so some of those topics I just mentioned and others, and those are also the, the topics at festivals, as we all know, like Astroectronica and in about 150 other festivals around the world. And, but then it is like a wall and the digital art doesn't enter the museum world so far, since uh, there are many reasons for that. F f the basic reason is that the museum is not, it's f a bit outdated, this, this structure. It's now 200 years old. It was very well qualified for um, paintings and sculpture, but it was not made for the digital age. And so we need to think of new structures. And uh, what I pro would propose is that, that we, uh, or f first I wanna, wanna say that our society is, is able to do such things like the uh, um, the archive of the, of the uh, NSA, for example, so where every data is stored of every human being. I don't want to propose such an archive for, for art, but I just want to say that if our society wants something, then they can do such things. But on the other hand, the, 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 uh, the digital art of our time, from which we all see on festivals, tens of thousands of people going to these festivals, but only for two weeks. It's, it's not an, an entering our museum system so far and archive systems. And so maybe our federalism, which we have in Germany and Austria and many other European countries, um, can help with, with that. That we could, as we know Germany, for example, I use the example of Germany, has 6,500 museums. If only 1% of them, so 65 museums, would be dedicated to digital art and even we would say, okay, Bavaria, you guys build up a, tech, uh, a technological framework which guarantees the um, pres persistence, the um, uh, preservation of, the, of uh, interactive arts. Baden-Württemberg, you guys do uh, um, um, build a competency, network of competency for bio art, um, Brandenburg for net art and so on. And then, then we would cover the whole field of, of digital art um, and and uh, even this old and and often s uh, small unit uh, uh, structure of a museum where you have a few curators but not many people uh, left who could uh, preserve technology, for example, on this larger framework, which would be more appropriate to our to the digital revolution and to the art of our time, would be um, probably a, a step toward. Um, the opening of, of the museum and, and um, that we would allow a, a society which is from tech of taxpayers who finance the museum, which has the duty even by law to um, preserve and, and to uh, present and, and collect the art of, of our time. Um, I think that this, this would um, give a, um, a democratic society um, so, so somehow um, the art of its time back and the ability to reflect on big um, issues like climate change and uh, surveillance and, and all that through the art of, of our time in the institutions which are paid by us. Okay. Yes, thank you, Mariana. If you could also address the same question. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, yeah, first of all, I, I would like to thank Patricia for, for your uh, presentation today because it shows that it is going on. It is going on meticulously with a stamina uh, from inside the museum. So it is happening, uh, but ever so slow and with like a big prestigious museum like the Tate. Um, so we also have like a... Uh, that's right, a widespread landscape of museums, but also museums that are, uh, that are uh, distributed uh, into a, a hierarchy. Uh, and I think you need to take that into consideration as well um, to, evolve, uh, um, um, to evolve the, the collection and preservation and uh, accessibility of, of media art. Um, 
I also think uh, that uh, we need to address that uh, um, media art in institutions uh, would need um, um, a new field of uh, cross expertise, which was also something you pointed to. Um, but I would also like maybe to turn the table and say, what can we learn from media art? Uh, that media art has, through uh, its history of at least 60 years, uh, been involved in impacting society in various ways uh, and is now, like, uh, through the digital transformation, really spreading its impact through festivals. Um, but that uh, media art and I think the presentations uh, um, at this conference have shown that, uh, that media art is also um, teaching institutions, is altering uh, archival formats, is altering the way we consider infrastructures. Um, uh, and I think that's really important uh, to take into account. Uh, the museums should evolve, but should also learn from the fact the way that media art has um, all the way been working across uh, infrastructures, uh, pushing archival formats, pushing the way uh, um, the public is engaged. And I think that, that might be sort of the next step to talk about how would we preserve, collect, uh, um, the media art that is actually, um, well, dancing the archive, uh, um, and also um, um, playing the infrastructures, uh, using uh, museum uh, material, hardware, the buildings, the sensor-rich buildings, uh, the buildings that are uh, um, collecting or potentially collecting a lot of, of uh, audience data. How could media art help um, bridge between the institution, the society, and the audience? I think uh, that, that is going on. Uh, it is going on with uh, like an art uh, collective like uh, Persona Non Data. Uh, who like played the Somerset uh, House and the Courthold Gallery uh, in 2015. Um, and it's a learning process. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Christopher, if you don't mind me quickly repeating the question so that we all remember it, um, how museums and archives need to evolve in order to collect, preserve, and show the digital art of our time. Thank you very much. Well, the MAC is uh, an applied arts museum that also collects co <coughs> contemporary fine art, uh, uh, but we uh, have obviously uh, not that kind of o obligation. Uh, we can be more eclectic. Um, which is in a way uh, right and true and in a way wrong. I will uh, tell you why. Um, for us it's more important, I mean we were the first museum in the world that for instance acquired a piece of art uh, with bitcoins. Um, it was a screensaver work in the age where we don't need screensaver service anymore by Harm van den Dorper. But what is really interesting to me is kind of um, uh, trying to promote the dialogue between art, architecture, and design with also, of course, uh, science, the academic world, research technology, um, and uh, civil society. So we also started processes on civil, uh, uh, citizen science. Um, I think uh, our main role is really to make people aware, to make our society aware that uh, for the last 10 years we, live, we have lived in a new modernity which started with uh, the first smartphone that was presented 10 years ago, which changed everything and we have to shape this new modernity. Um, and we need all the inputs uh, we can get from everywhere in this process of shaping this modernity because if we don't shape it uh, actively, technology will shape us. Yeah? And that's what we are currently experiencing. 
Um, so that's also the reason why I, I founded the Vienna Biennale, which is the world's first biennale for art, architecture, and design to work on positive change in digital modernity um, and to really deal with uh, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the future of human work, and so on. Um, I think the relevant question is, what is the truly, um, let's say, relevant digital art out there? Of course, you have to curate that art, you have to make a selection, yeah? We, what is the art of our time that is really representative of the time of this digital modernity we live in? Um, our approach would be that we uh, have to act as a platform that asks the relevant questions and tries to kind of uh, uh, get the, the most relevant artists, designers, architects and others associated um, and commission also projects in the future that are relevant and uh, answer those questions uh, that we need to ask and where we also uh, probably need uh, avenues uh, how to address those questions. The question of preservation, I, um, I leave to others. I mean, it's a tricky issue, uh, but I think um, uh, the selection is very important. I, I, w I would like to refer to, you know, that the next big thing out there is VR, uh, of course, uh, next to artificial and general intelligence. There's a fantastic interview in the November edition of Art Forum uh, bet um, between Daniel Birnbaum um, and Douglas Copeland. Um, and one thought we all should always remember, and you probably discussed it at length here in the last couple of days, um, the art in a new technology becomes kind of really interesting when that technology has been overtaken by a new technology. So now we have really, really important uh, art in many fields relating to TV. We have rather the acceptance let's say relevant art dealing with VR is rather the exception. There's a lot out there in terms of education, very advanced education, uh, and, and above all entertainment in VR. Uh, but I think the, uh, the time when VR will be a, a big topic uh, for relevant art, and this sounds kind of strange, uh, is really when the next technology will overtake VR. So this is probably something we can also discuss later on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Sarah, if you could Thanks. also continue with the statement. Uh, I, because I make things, big things that could be collected, <laughs> um, it, maybe it's interesting to reflect on those, um, those processes, often involving clusters of computers, not a single computer, and uh, the fact that to, to install one of our works requires a team of specialists that we know that we train that oh, we, we don't train, they train us usually. <laughs> uh, and software engineers remaking works sometimes depending on certain changes in technology. The, these, these nuances to keep these works on tour around the world uh, are, are quite significant. And I, uh, I'm always at sleep at night wondering, oh God, you know, what if the plane crashes with Damien on or this single person that that is the sole uh, insight into how this whole thing will come together in the end. Um, so that's certainly one issue. And I th but what we do do is we do a lot of documentation and uh, we don't so much document code in the way that we probably should, but we document experience of the work and we also document all the technical infrastructure that's involved in putting them together. And I think that this is a useful practice for people who make stuff. So the people that are making things that are technically complex need to take on that responsibility so that it makes your job when it does get collected a lot easier. I think that would be uh, a useful thing. Uh, the, uh, actually, both the, the session before this was quite interesting and, and Richard Reinhardt mentioned this idea of not having a language to be able to describe new media accurately to a non-specialist audience was a real big problem. And this idea it sort of skirts around standards, but that, uh, uh, that there might be an art and architecture thesaurus of new media art, which uh, would dovetail into the conservation issue, absolutely useful, 
Um, does it exist? I'm not sure. Uh, and could it be a, a useful approach? Uh, and that, that flows into other aspects of the work that we're doing where uh, there are no standards, actually, for the, the stuff we're creating. There's no standard for 3D motion capture data of a Kung Fu master or, or something like this. And uh, so that standards issue I think is really cri critical in a preservation sense uh, for, for how these things um, can be ac accurately described and ultimately shared and conserved. Uh, thank you. Oh, and the network of people that you mentioned that, you know, there's uh, the fostering uh, and maybe research funding, but it's that collaboration between universities who can solve specific hard challenges and the, the GLAM sector who need these solutions uh, and develop in-house their own solutions, that that is a network that needs to be um, uh, helped along. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, just a little preface here. Um, Oliver just asked me to be on the panel yesterday, so I didn't have time to really think about this, and I, I think I kind of got the question a little bit wrong. but um, So last night I went and I looked at things that I had written long ago. So I'm just going to give a couple of quotes from those and use those to try to see what will happen, uh, where, where we should be heading. Um, so in 1987, 30 years ago, uh, I wrote a piece called Changing Museum. Let me just give you a quick quote from that. Um, eventually, new areas of research, such as pattern recognition, will be applied to these museum systems, allowing the computer to, to do some preliminary syntactical analysis of works of art. The computer will be able to give statistics as to quantities of various colors used and their distribution around the canvas. Later, it should be able to analyze angles and line of sight flows through paintings and moving images. Finally, the computer should be able to view the composition of a work of art as a system similar to a language and break it down into its interrelating com components to see how they work together, much as computerized language analysis does, essentially semiotics. So something like that we've seen reflected uh, yesterday in the talk on Wes, Wes Anderson, uh, analysis of Wes Anderson's film, um, a poster session on systems, um, and um, you know, I think this feeds into uh, what, what George LaGrady was talking about earlier today uh, in terms of visualization. And um, certainly it's a, um, it's a trend among cultural institutions to participate, all types of institutions, to participate in big data where, where the, the kind of information you have in your own institution becomes fodder for doing something else, for analysis, as George did with the library information, for creation of new works um, where you know, appropriation work is based on things that exist in our cultural institutions already. Um, so uh, I also went back and looked at um, a very poorly named book uh, that I wrote two chapters of 20 years ago. It was published by the American Association of Museums. It's called The Wired Museum. Not, 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 not thinking very far ahead, actually. Um, but in that, uh, kind of spinning off of what Sarah just said, a lot of the focus was on standards that would allow others to work with the contents. Um, uh, so artists, researchers, developers, visitors, to build upon museum collections with new art, visualization, newer curations, things like that. And that kind of feeds into uh, um, a very lengthy uh, paper that I wrote 
12 years ago with Steve Dietz, uh, uh, Anne Borda, uh, Pierre Levy, and Kati Geber uh, called the Virtual Museum, The Next Generation. And one of the key elements of that was that in order to be a museum in the future, you have to really engage with the audience in very new ways. And, you know, we have 100 pages about that. Um, so, so kind of taking this stuff and focusing on, on uh, the heart of the question, um, from my own perspective as someone who trains people to be conservators in this area, uh, I really think we need more training and specialization specifically uh, in this area. Um, and that's pretty complex because uh, to be a time-based media conservator uh, requires knowledge about media art history, technology, and documentation, standards, metadata, things like that. Um, and um, museums really have not made that, made it a priority with funding and procedures to handle these. Uh, there aren't many institutions with time-based media programs, uh, with time-based media conservators, with uh, curators. Uh, there are more curators than anything else. Um, we've made a lot of progress. One of the, one of the key things that advanced museums have done is uh, that before a work is acquired, a whole team from all the departments of the museum, from curatorial to conservation to registrar, get together to examine the piece and look at what it's like to reinstall it. Okay. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for all of your thoughts and uh, for the largest panel of the conference. You guys are in perfect time. We have a nice uh, long discussion time that we can really be able to go deeper into these issues and then also be able to open up to the public afterwards as well. I would like to just take a moment and say a few things that I found points between you and then um, be able to let you continue, continue talking. Um, one is that the conversation has been continuing for a long time. There's a long, a long-standing uh, body of research and body of, of work that can be drawn upon and built upon. Um, but there is every time there is new technology that takes over the old technology that has to be learned from, that has to be updated. There has to be people who understand it to be able to bring it into the next phase. We're constantly pushing definitions, both definitions in language and also definitions in how we understand what the parameters of the works are, which means that we are needing to be able to teach institutions and also teach the makers and teach the uh, archivists as well, which then of course requires a curation and documentation. It requires people to be making decisions about what's going to be looked at, how it's going to be looked at, what kind of documentation strategy what kind of standards are going to be there, and also looking at collaboration and communication on an international level and also on institutional levels as well. What I think is some commonalities among all of you. Um, I would like to open the floor first for the panelists to be able to discuss among themselves, perhaps if you have questions for one another, and um, then we'll open up at, right afterwards to the, um, the, to the Q and A. You have one microphone. There's also there's also a microphone here. Um, I would like to address an issue that was kind of was mentioned in terms of uh, we have also to show art that is really relevant to the people, relevant to the people. Um, for me, a huge issue is remix. We live in an age of remixing. Uh, museum ha museums have uh, some have huge collections. Um, what I find always very interesting is to commission artists um, to, to kind of remix existing work in a museum with new technologies. I'll give you an example. Uh, we have, uh, the MAC is one of the most important glimpses. It's kind of nine fairly big panels 
uh, draft uh, cartoons for, for a mosaic frieze uh, that is in Brussels, but the original is by Klimt and that's in our museum. So it's a huge work and um, of course it's a fabulous piece that you could kind of translate into um, VR. Yeah. So we're going to do that. Next year is a big Klimt here. Um, and we uh, commission um, a filmmaker that works in uh, VR to, to kind of remix the Klimt and, and uh, uh, create a new work of art uh, in VR that takes this Klimt as a point of departure. And this is just an example, but I think uh, museums also should uh, think about the existing works, non-digital works, and how you can use digital technologies uh, to get those works also across to a new audience, in new guises, and then also lead them to the original. So are you going to collect that artwork that you commission? I think that's the idea, yeah. Yeah, I also want to, to add to that. Um, so the work, what you do, for example, at Tate, and um, it was done at the VNA and at Guggenheim and the MoMA and also at the ZKM, although they just have one and a half positions there at the ZKM, it's fantastic. It's totally needed, but it's evidently not enough. And um, when I talk to, to people from the preservation field, then they say, well, most of the case studies are made, but now we need concerted action. So we need to, to somehow, all these individual uh, museums, they need to somehow to, to work together. We need a, we need a higher structure. And, and if you talk to politicians, cultural politicians, for example, the German uh, um, culture, Staatskulturministerin, uh, um, and ask her at the Jewish Museum, there was recently a conference, I asked her, do you intend to enable the museums that they can preserve the digital art of our, culture, of our time? And then she says, yeah, we have the ZKM. And she doesn't, doesn't know, has not really, yeah, you love, but it, this is the truth, this is the political situation. And uh, so there's so much, uh, un, not enough knowledge in this, in this area. And um, we also tried to in, invite some, from in Austria, some, some cultural politicians, but maybe also due to all the um, coalition building at the moment, they all said, no, uh, please not at the moment. Um, but it's an urgent question and, and we need to a, a address that. And um, it could start so simple that, um, f uh, supported by the ministry, a, a questionnaire would be sent to all museums in Austria and Germany, etc. How many digital artworks do you have in your collection and what do, are you doing to preserve them? Then the result, well, I can tell you <laughs> 0 0.001. And the, and the result, we all know, we lose all the art of, our, of digital art. It's, it's, uh, the f rule of thumb is that artworks older than 10 years you cannot show anymore. And so the structure so far, you, you wrote in 87 articles on that, did not, uh, was not successful. We need to think, rethink the whole, uh, and, and we need to push the, the, the development and that, that we don't lose another five, five decades of, of digital art. Yeah, I think maybe a survey would be interesting as a kind of proof of something. Uh, you know, the surveys of digital practices uh, have been done for uh, arts and humanities uh, uh, research, um, actually showing really interesting uh, results also transnationally. So that could be a point. I was thinking whether one might find leverage for this um, outside, like uh, cultural politics, looking at something where, you know, art, artistic practices, uh, artistic research is now being um, uh, highlighted um, um, in, uh, in collaboration with science. Um, um, there was just a festival in, in, uh, in Oslo on uh, um, emotion tech where the artists that uh, have been um, have fellowships with uh, with CERN was invited to talk about how do they work. Uh, so that might be a way to to leverage something like the the obligations or um, what you would call it 
from the uh, uh, cultural politics from uh, um, to to move into this. So, uh, in terms of the problem that Oliver just mentioned, that these places the, that museums don't collect these things. We're, we're kind of up against two opposite problems. The reasons they don't collect it are either they know too little, they think digital lasts forever, and so why do we bother collecting it? Or they know too much, that it's going to cost an awful lot, we don't have the resources to do this. And addressing those problems are completely different how we address them. You know, with the, it costs too much, that's a funding and a resource kind of thing, and that's where you try to talk to that minister uh, in Germany, uh, or we, you know, we, or we have the, our declaration that we did in, what, Liverpool was that? Um, um, uh, but the other problem, which is a very popular problem, it has to be addressed in a very different way by a broader um, uh, group than, uh, than ourselves, which is the idea digital lasts forever. And that is just not true. And, 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 and most people have experienced their own digital files no longer being able to, their word processing files not being able to play. Uh, play. But they, don't, they still don't recognize that digital does not last forever. I totally agree with you that there are those two problems and I think there is a third one. Because one of the solutions usually is to keep the equipment. Uh, and I totally agree with you also um, with something that you said before, that there is a total lack of standards. There are no standards, and this is something that when I was talking about that memory is a kind of commodity and a corporate issue, this is really the problem. So every institution and every country and every group works with their own parameters and their own standards, and this is really, and this makes us really vulnerable to all changes. This is one problem. The second one is those uh, two issues that you mentioned, and the third one is that many institutions, they, they, they decide to keep the equipment and to store everything as it were the final decision. So if you keep, keep the VHS player, everything is solved. If you keep uh, the Umatic, the beta, or everything else, if you keep your old computer, and it is not, and it doesn't work like this because the infrastructure changes and everything changes. And moreover, because in the future, you will need just a museum for everything that you kept and where the people will stay, because we will need kind of in 50 years where we will stay, we will need just a kind of, uh, there is a, a very interesting book by Ricardo Piglia, is an Argentinian uh, writer. Do you read Argentinian fiction? They are the best ones. Borges, Ricardo Piglia, you should. And the book, I don't know if it is translated into English, but it would be something like the absent city, the La Ciudad Ausente. And it is the story of a city that they uh, move the city inside the machine. The machine is the museum. And everything goes there because they need to keep their memories somewhere. So the city at one point is empty because they stored everything there. And so they die at the end. And this is something that you must think about when if we will keep all the equipment, what will we will do? How much space we will need? And how long they will, they will live? And who will keep this equipment running on? And is it possible to keep, if we don't have standards, and if we will keep 
just running everything, uh, following just the, the rules of companies and not having some kind of syndicate or common decision or cultural policy that it's more international and global to that address really uh, digital culture as it is. Uh, this is something that really uh, disturbs me. Okay. If, if I may, if I may also expand on this a little bit, and Sarah, you may be going in that just, direction. Just a comment. Yes. Ethical framework is maybe what you mean, yeah, and ethics of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I would I would like to draw back a little bit um, to the word that we used in the in the question, which is the word evolve. So if you could perhaps address a little bit about how museums and archives, that our notion of them, perhaps, or the work that they're doing need to evolve to be able to address this a bit more. I mean, I think that there's, like you said, that there's this, there's a cultural political aspect to it, and then there's the technological aspect to it, and then there's the aspect of we have an evolving definition of what these institutions are supposed to be. And if you could address that just in the last bit of um, moments that are only for the discussants, and then we'll open it up to the rest of the group as well. It's a commonly uh, discussed topic, but it's uh, about, it's, it's kind of emulation topic, but it's do you preserve the computers and the screens and the software, or do you document it to the degree that you can reproduce on new frameworks a similar experience? So you have to understand the nature of experience, um, which is critical to the archiving of the work. And is that something that comes up at the Tate when you discuss it? Because I know that you're collecting specific works, but if you were not able to collect the bits and pieces that make them up, would you have a different uh, approach? Would you... So, for instance, I've got this nice machine. It's got 56 projectors and 29 computers. You're never going to collect it. Um, but you could say it's a panoramic system that does X, yeah? That's our approach. Yeah. That's the approach. Yeah, no. Maybe if you screw with him, maybe. Yeah, here we go. This one. Thank you. So, no, that, that's what we do in our acquisition process is understand what we need to keep or, or, or have in our hands that can preserve the work. In a very or what well can be changed. Uh, so this applies mm -hmm. to media, but also, I was joking yeah. about the computer because it's something that the, computer, the, the artist gave us. So it's the sort standard, of like, a, a, we call them an artist verified proof. It means it's been installed, uh, it's been run, the artist knows this is how it should type, look like. But we also make loads of copies of it and we know that computer is going to die. So it's, we're keeping, well, we're conservators in a museum, so that's what we do, but we also know that it's not the solution, so. It's text in 1997. I think, can I bring, I'm not trying to remove the responsibility of the museums. I'm just trying to think that a really successful process that happened with video is all the work that was yeah, done yeah, yeah, yeah. with cooperatives of artists that just got together to preserve their works. And I mean, I, I, I know that museums have some responsibility, but I also wonder, is, is there such a similar cooperatives no, with like artists nowadays? Yeah. Um, so, is this working? No. Okay, so uh, in New York, uh, my students as well as a number of other people have created something called Transfer Collective. Um, this is an organization working directly with artists to preserve their work, to reformat and preserve their work and keep it alive. And Transfer Collective started out as a project in the new museum where um, they just made appointments with artists to come in and the transfer was part of the exhibit. Um, so uh, a part, there were two pieces to it. One side was video transfer to digital. The other side was did old digital, like ancient digital transfer to newer works. But um, yes, uh, they, they go around to 
uh, artist festivals to recruit artists. Um, so yes, and this is filling a gap that museums aren't filling. Um, and it's, it's, it, so far it's been very successful. It's been about five years. And there are other transfer collectives in other cities that have copied. Uh, uh, so the original was in Manhattan, there's one in Atlanta and some other cities, so yes. Um, if we could very quickly give the mic to Mariana in case she has a couple of a last statement before you need to go and catch your flight. I so. wanted to ask her. Uh, okay. I wanted okay. to ask, ask her something. And, and so I'm and, and say, um, responding also, or adding to that, what, what you said there, as we know, there are art, artworks out there like Osmos, for example, a classic from Ja Davis. 200 a scientific articles were yeah, published on... Trying to observe... Uh, 200 to scientific uh, articles were published this on this artwork. But you cannot see it in any a, museum as of the world. And, um, okay, you cannot see it in any museum of the world. And, and she herself had to um, to, to recalculate it on now, on, uh, which was originally a, 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 a supercomputer. Now it's now she has it on PC level. So the artist herself has to do that. And, and such a famous artwork. And um, so I think in the end, we, as a society, we have to, to think if we want to have memory, and even yep. if it's digital memory, and the NSA is, is, is doing that, <laughs> they, they are the perfect memory institution. And of course, we shouldn't follow the NSA, but it, it is possible somehow. And, 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 um, and one step also, uh, I, and this I would like to ask you, um, what the Europeana can do, um, that digital art is, is, is better um, um, included in, in, in the data model. Stop. Yeah. 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 Is it? Yeah. It was Europeana is uh, an, an aggregator. Uh, the project, so it's aggregating what? Um, Europeana is to a very large extent an uh, aggregating uh, a transnational institution, a European uh, institution. So I was looking into no. No media art. Um, it a lot of um, it's built it's on uh, um, the the um, sort of the European um, um, collaborating uh, libraries originally. Um, um, but maybe something like uh, the Europeana networks. Um, um, which is much more like community-based, could actually uh, uh, move forward uh, um, working with uh, archives. There is an archive, Ada. Uh, there are other archives. I think that would be a possibility, actually, to create a kind of, of uh, clustering that would be transnational. Um, and that would then, in a way, hang on the Europeana organization and and uh, push for for policy through that. Thank you. Um, let's give the mic to uh, Christoph and let you be able to go so you don't worry about missing your flight. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> no, I, just, I just wanted to add to that that I think there's really a strong case for co-ownership of digital works between several museums uh, across um, countries. Um, I mean, it's, I guess it's a smart idea anyway, but it's probably more difficult to carry out if it's a very um, expensive oil painting. Digital art really lends itself to it, and I think uh, it would also help kind of uh, showing the work more often, etc. Of course, it's also maybe about uh, less works you have to curate, but really, really outstanding works uh, should be owned by several museums, I guess, yeah. If it's editions, it's a different thing, yeah. Uh, but in general, I think there is a strong case because then you could also um, look at each other kind of peer review uh, in terms of conservation. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the, one of the reasons for the creation of matters in media art in the first place was to figure out what would happen if, uh, well, 
one set, one particular collector was thinking of giving their work to multiple museums, and they wanted to see what what would happen um, and how how that could work. So that was part of the origin of of that really important project that Patricia has worked on. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions for one another before we open it up to the rest of the audience to po perhaps pose questions to you? No? Are you okay? Okay. Well, we already have five, then, and they all raise their hand at the same time. So whoever gets the microphone first gets to have the first question. Or comments. Yes, questions or comments are allowed as well. How much? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. My name is Patricia Engel, and um, I would first of all like to thank you for this great conference. Uh, second, I would like to address the question of conservation. Um, I should say that I'm a conservator of traditional cultural heritage. And um, I uh, especially saw a connection between what I learned here and heard here between this and my field in the conservation theory. The conservation roots in conservation theory and despite the fact that we have many approaches to conservation theory in our traditional field, I just had attended a huge international conference on conservation where especially conservation theory led to a wide and wild debate. And I, my suggestion is, or my question to you is, if you would see a benefit of interdisciplinary uh, discussion on conservation theory. Well, t two of us are in the conservation world. Uh, Patricia and me uh, are, are heavily involved in the world of conservation. Uh, she was trained as a conservator. Um, what, what do you mean with interdisciplinary? I'm sort of thinking there's I don't see any other option, actually. And uh, in the way I'm thinking about why we're conserving the works, our works, and how, you know, I, I'm, I can't avoid, I have four years or five years of training in conservation, so I did all the Cesare Brandi and architecture and so on. But then you, you can't help but adjusting that to, to this different reality that you have with media works. So I, I'm sort of thinking, in which way would you want the disciplinarity to happen? Mm -hmm. I think you, well, it's actually finding the right literature and I think conservators are missing a lot of the literature that is, has happened in the last few years. I must say I'm not the best follower either, so, but there's quite a lot published. Um, Tiziana Cayanello, mm. about collecting, preserve, preserving, displaying uh, media arts. And they're not explicitly theory of conservation, but I, I think it's there. Maybe you, you could publish a theory of media conservation. But it's a lot there. Okay. And um, if you look at um, Cool, the conservation online, there's plenty there, uh, lots of literature there on, on media conservation. Um, at the, uh, the North American Conservation uh, Association, AIC, has a group, EMG, that is just focused on media art. Uh, 
that's very, very active? I think that's one of the reasons why this conference series is international, and though it might be held in one continent more often than the next, uh, there's uh, almost all continents are represented here uh, within the people who are coming. So thank you. We need to make sure that we're always reading one another's literature across the different nations and also mm -hmm. reading one another's languages as well. Let's go to another question over here. Hello? Yes. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for uh, this panel. I, I, I'm, I'm, really, uh, I'm really happy this is taking place. It's a very important topic, and I heard very different points of view uh, on, these, uh, on these issues. I do want to add two points, uh, I think. The first one, uh, by the way, I'm Schalke van der Meulen, and I work, besides my university job, I work for two museums in the Netherlands. Um, the Stedelijk Museum and the Van Gogh Museum, the Van Gogh Museum. Um, so the first is that um, I think if we want the digital art of our times to somehow come into the museum, then I think it's important to think also about the different status and role of museums today. I mean, as the digital arts were being introduced in the 1990s, the museums have been changing enormously. And so they are kind of, at least in the Netherlands, let me just limit myself to the Netherlands, they have been pushed into money-making machines. And so there are, um, as Andreas Hussen says so beautifully in his essay, the museum as mass medium. And I think we have to take that into account because I think that say something about, you know, if you want to uh, achieve something, you have to think about resources and money and how museums can not just, you know, uh, they don't just see what it costs them, but also what it brings them. Otherwise, they won't uh, do it. Uh, the, second, uh, the second point is uh, that I'm working as a museum educator, and it was just two weeks ago, there was a big, big conference, the first one, for mu museum educators in uh, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And talking about priorities, somehow all the money seems to flow there. Uh, there's a lot of money put in public. Uh, as more and more commercial the museums become, there's so much money going into the public, away from art, in a sense. And uh, so, yeah, you have to somehow know the other factors and priorities in museums in order to, I think, uh, get uh, digital art uh, into, into the museum and recognize. Uh, maybe I can end with one example. The Van Gogh Museum has made a virtual reality of the bedroom of Van Gogh. You know, it works wonderfully well. You know, because why they're doing it? Because they know they are you know, you know, achieving in China. People want to see this and they want to go. They want to to enter uh, the the virtual space. But that's of course not avant-garde digital art. But it makes money. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments on this while we're looking for the next question, or go to the next question? Okay. Let's go over here. Yeah. Is it on? Yes. Oh, great. Yes. Thank you for the um, panel. It's great. So what I'd like to throw in a couple of uh, perspectives from, from the practicing end of, of things. I'm, I'm an artist, and I've been doing interactive media for nearly 30 years. Uh, so some of the challenges that I see in terms of negotiating the, the, the space of museums and collections are, first of all, much of the new media projects are experimental in, in nature and therefore fragile in terms of their actual uh, makeup. So the challenge is how do we, how do we um, resolve that? And um, on the other end, there's the challenge of who makes the selections and, and one of the great things I learned from Oliver is the focus of this CREMS program to train curators because one of the challenges when I deal with curators is they just don't have the kind of uh, specialized educational background to be able to kind of discern things. So, they, so there's a reliance on, on the commercial gallery situation and so, and Basically, a commercial gallery is, is a shopkeeper, not necessarily an intellectual. 
uh, you know, somebody who's looking at the future of, of, of this field. And so um, I'm, I just want to throw that out. So I think, I think that what we end up seeing is that a lot of the works that end up in collections, from, based on my observations, are the, 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 the more simple works, let's say, for lack of better uh, terminology. They're simple in terms of maintenance and simple in terms of ideas. And then, and then meanwhile, the, the, the really complex works never enter the discourse. And so that's something that I think we need to, to consider in the long-term situation. Okay, thank you. Diego? Hello, I'm Diego. I'm a student of the Master of Media Histories program. And my question is for all the panel. Um, taking into account how fast things change in new media art, especially in computer-based artworks, how do you think a standard should look like? What, what, the, what kind of requirements that a standard that you're talking should fulfill? Well, one thing that I would love, well, we've started seeing that actually, is artists using open source techniques. So just making sure that what you're doing is available and documented, but it's not a standard, of course, but then again, it's a start. So I think then uh, you need to make a distinction from the artwork and then the media that's used in the artwork related to standard, because these are different things. We're not talking about an artwork being a standard, yeah? So hopefully not a standard, yeah? Very idiosyncratic. Um, so I think those things need to be separated. Uh, and it's all, also this, this conversation is a, is a bit muddy because it goes out into uh, archival s stuff as opposed to artworks, made of archives, let's say, or not. Um, so media artworks uh, sit aside from the archive, let's say. And um, so when I talked about standards, I meant that related to certain types of media involved in them and why you need standard is so you can share, right? It's a simple metadata thing and linked open data means the more data sets that can be shared, um, uh, the, the more enriched we become. And so that's kind of what we mean by standards, I think. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. Okay. Kristen, yes. Um, yeah, and we've worked, we work a lot with individual artists, and they're really surprised when we tell them that this would be more preservable if it was, if there were underlying standards, if they were using software, uh, open source software, standardized software, and a number of them just change their practice for their future projects mm -hmm. to, to be like that. They, they're just not aware. Okay. Thank you. Christoph. I think it's really important that um, art museums have uh, digital art and digital culture curators. And when I'm saying this, I mean curators who kind of uh, are on the job, being s specializing on that, but being also at the same time eminent specialists of contemporary art in general and then fighting in this specialist position also for kind of giving digital art uh, the appropriate space in the exhibition program, but also in the, in the collection um, uh, schedule, yeah. It's very important, we, we just uh, appointed somebody as a digital culture curator at our museum, and it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If we can, I'm going chronologically here of where I'm seeing hands. Yes. Can you hear me? No. <laughs> uh, Is it great? No. no. Can you hear me? Yeah. There. No. Okay. Uh, that's kind of a meter for the whole situation. Um, okay. So I have a. I had a couple of things, but I think I will uh, stay with one thing, which is actually kind of. Uh, of feeding out of the, the keynote this morning as well, um, this thing about addressing this uh, the, the, from, from the inside of the museum or maybe taking it outside. I mean, taking this, I, the, the, the question of 
the instituting and the institutionalization of media art. So is the museum the right place for media art? I'm in doubt. I'm not sure, actually, I don't think so, but that might just be my private <laughs> personal opinion. Uh, as Mariana, whom, whom I know very, very well, and I've been working with her many times, uh, so I know how she's thinking as well, that, that we've been discussing this kind of more broad infrastructure, and I think she was also pointing that out a little bit in her final remark, uh, which is more like an infrastructure going across institutional competences. But I think there is, a, there is um, an irritating and very important uh, decision to make for the museums before we can move ahead, that which is, do we really want this as part of the museum? And if you do, then that actually means that the institution might change it needs to run on a different paradigm. I will suggest that media art runs a different paradigm than contemporary art, for instance. But this is also another discussion. I'm, I'm, I tend to, to say that the most stable uh, things in this situation are the instabilities. <laughs> that, you know, we have these key instabilities that we can all think of, the documentation, the, the, the situation of, of uh, the obsolete technology, uh, the context that evolves and our aesthetic judgments and all these things, I've listed them. So they are always coming in and say, okay, these are the challenges. Maybe these, this could be the starting point of the discussion uh, and is, of course, how do, what is the best infrastructure for meeting these challenges? I'm not sure it's a museum. Okay, thank you. Just right, right behind you here. Does anybody have a quick statement on that? So I don't think that this panel is suggesting that either. I, I think everybody's looking for um, a network solution in that sense. And uh, so there will be instances in a museum, but equally in, in other contexts. And the infrastructure idea that could support um, the archivability of this material is, is definitely a multi-institutional type of thing. Um, and yeah, the, a Europeana type framework is possibly and uh, that kind of network, mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic, thank you. We have a question yeah. here. Hello, uh, okay. First of all, congratulations for this great uh, conference. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here, hear what I'm heard. Uh, I am Jose Alcala, I am director of um, electrographic artworks. So we have a lot of media artworks in our collections and we have over 120 pieces done by these obsolete programs like Director or Flash, okay? That there is no any machines that today can run that. So we have a special uh, computer dedicated to that. For example, Max use uh, System 9.0, okay? That can run these CD-ROMs, okay? And I have, I spend a lot of money of uh, programmers that can uh, actualize or, you know, updated these things. Uh, but the question is, uh, who is interested in it? So there are two questions for me. First, we must create the desire in people to uh, really uh, be affected, really love these pieces. This is the first thing we must do. To do that, we must create an artistic literature specialized on it. Literature means the storytelling, the stories, you know, with details that everybody understands and in, in charge in love with the artist, with the work, etc. In that case, maybe someday a museum that program an uh, exhibition of media art had this huge queue as, for example, El Bosco, no? or for example, Picasso. Okay? When we get it, I am sure that the managers of museums will be really interested in having, so in getting, in buying, in getting, in sewing, and in conserving. Then start the second problem is conserving, restoring. The Restoration as a scientific practice 
It's very new. It's very, very new. But if you go to the um, El, El Prado Museum, you have a special department only dedicated to conserve, to preserve works from El Bosco or from whatever in the 17th, 18th or 14th century. It has a lot of money to spend on it, okay? And this is a science practice. So a research that there are many congress, specialized congress, where these guys go from uh, Rick Museum, El, El Prado Museum, put together and discuss which is the best way of doing that. Can you imagine a department specialized in conserving and restoring digital art? I met three people here, three programmers, very young people, that can do these things. If I could get this guy, one of those guys, in my museum, I'm paying every month, every year, there were no problem. They were always being updating uh, systems, hardware, software, etc., and being going all around the world just to Congress specialize in deciding how is the best way of doing these things. So the thing is clear. First, create the desire in the people to make a long queue of two hours of queue to go and see this and this, enjoy this media art. And then, everything is done. The conservative and the museums will spend a lot of money of having a specialized department with programmers and technicians dedicated to conserve, preserve, updated these uh, pieces. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. That seems to be more of a statement than a question. Um, we have people from the other panels who are waiting to get into this room, and it, so it might get loud here for a moment. Um, I would like to thank you all very, very much for participating in this conversation. I think we could probably continue on and go in many directions from media art writing to media art standards to uh, conservation and collection. Thank you very, very much for participating, and we're going to give everybody a round of applause. <laughs>